I'm Abby Brown. I teach at Torrey Pines High School in San Diego. I've brought four of my students with us here to the Wolfram Conference to present this year. And I'm Eric Nelson, founder and CEO of Augment, and we are presenting high school teaching and programmer training with Mathematica. Um, I'm here with Eric Nelson from Augment Software along with four of my students. Uh, we have Joseph Quo, who's currently a student at uh, University of Illinois here in Champaign, Alex Krotz, who's attending Caltech, and Kevin Lynn and Shashir Reddy, who are seniors with me at Torrey Pines in uh, San Diego, California. And uh, we're all like amazed at the amazing rain that you have here in Champaign. It's, uh, you know, those of us spoiled weather wimps from uh, San Diego. So a uh, little background about me. Um, I've been a Mathematica user since the early 90s. And uh, I used it as a college student and then later as a teacher, um, as a tool to, you know, create resources for my classes. And eventually I had students put together their, their own activities and incorporate Mathematica into their presentations. In 2006, I started a class that we call the Advanced Topics in Math class, which is a project-based course. Um, and I've had students present here um, several times in the past with some of the work that they've done there. Uh, so some of the highlights of my experiences with Mathematica have included working with the Wolfram community. It's been so great to be back and see familiar faces and uh, strike up old conversations again from the past. Um, I've been able to enjoy the flexibility of creating my own course um, that's projects based and, and really having the freedom to kind of do whatever we want, which I know is very unusual in a high school setting. Um, uh, my students give presentations every day. It's always a joy to see what they'll come up with and, and how they share that work. And at the end of each school year, we do a big projects fair with the students in not just my advanced topics class, but my other calculus classes as well. We call it our math open house. And if any of you are in the San Diego area in May, or you know, you're looking for a reason to take a trip, um, send me a note and we'll have you come along to our uh, um, event. It's on the 30th of May. Got the date up there. And uh, we've also done some work with client-based projects where the students reach out to people they know or in the community to work on projects for them. And we've also been focusing in recent years on getting more students published on the demonstrations website. Um, there's been a lot of challenges and lessons learned. I tried to just pick a few here to mention today. Um, I've learned not to get committed to a lesson plan since the technology changes. Um, I was running version 9 when my students were running version 10 because it takes a month or so to get my tech guys to update the computers in my classroom because I don't get administrator rights to do that. And all of a sudden these entity things start popping up and I have no idea what that means. Or I've created an assignment that I think is a really interesting little graphics challenge to find a way to draw number lines by creating their own function. They were all done in 30 seconds because they found number line plot that I didn't even know existed. Um, the technology logistics within a school district are difficult. Like I said, it can take maybe a month for me to get updated. To this school year, I had I finally scheduled the guy to come in and update the computers in my cart, in my classroom. He wheeled them out the door. I went to my desk to check email. Wolfram has now released 11.0.1. Yeah, that's not happening anytime soon for me. Um, convincing my colleagues to use Mathematica. Um, a lot of them just look at it as like, this is some intimidating programming thing. I've been very excited to see a lot of the additional entry points that Wolfram Research has put together into Mathematica here at the conference. Um, I want to explore those some more. But then I have teachers who want to learn, and they really just don't have time to learn. Um, when we're in the classroom um, and dealing with new curriculum and a lot of things going on, it's, it's difficult to find that time to really get in. So that's something I want to work on some more. And making connections uh, for my students in the real world and finding real world applications because my real world is a high school classroom. So how do I find ways to make it relevant to students? Um, a little, a little less than a year ago, I got this phone call from Eric Nelson, this guy in Minnesota interested in uh, working with students in high schools and using Mathematica. And he had found me on the internet 
and uh, he told me that he does programmer training using Mathematica. And now he's been working with some of my students and I've had the pleasure of watching them blend the skills that they have learned in my classes with things that they have learned through Augment. So the students who are here today are going to be uh, sharing um, some of their work and some of their process with you that they have developed through Augment. So I'm gonna turn it over to Joseph who's gonna talk about some of his experiences. Hi, I'm Joseph, and I'm here, I'm here as a student from the uh, University of Illinois. And uh, last year, I worked on a project. Uh, I was part of a pilot group, and so we developed a game. And we developed a game because games are fun, but, and also they're <coughs> intriguing. But more importantly, it provided us, us a single context to learn a whole bunch of concepts. And so uh, the most important thing that I got out of this was the importance of documentation. And uh, as you can see here, we have our designer's intent and our pseudocode, and uh, our code is uh, well commented. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to collaborate much better, and therefore we're allowed to <coughs> uh, develop uh, specialties in which we called a jigsaw team, which each individual uh, is allowed to go narrow and far into one small thing. And so, <coughs> by collaborating, we can create uh, something much greater. And so, uh, so I'm gonna demo the game. Uh, we created a game, we called it the Bird Brain Game, and uh, uh, this is supposed to assess the intelligence of birds, and in our case, we adapted it for humans. And so, uh, when we run the game, it creates a list of colors, so in our case, uh, the first one is blue, then it's green, then black, and so that, uh, uh, the player uh, cycles through uh, the training session, and uh, during the training session, uh, uh, the player knows that the one on the right is greater than the one on the left. So as you can see, uh, blue is, <coughs> I mean, uh, yellow is after blue. And so that after uh, going through all these pairs, uh, they will uh, eventually figure out this list. And uh, when they begin testing, uh, they'll be presented with uh, two colors, and they have to uh, identify which, if uh, these are in the correct order, which uh, this one in the case is. And uh, I'm going to show you what happens if we get it wrong, which I'm going to say that this one's true. And so as you can see, it shows that, uh, <coughs> uh, that uh, sometimes you can be right, sometimes you can be wrong. And so more importantly, bird brain game can be used as a model to uh, assess intelligence. And we can test our theories that we have about it. For example, uh, one theory that we might have is that birds might be better at mem memorizing lists than humans are. And so that uh, we can test this theory. And so I'm going to uh, hand this over to Alex, who's going to talk more about models. Take away, Alex. Thank you, Joseph. Hi, my name is Alex Krotz. I'm a student at Caltech. Uh, and I want to talk to you for a little bit about the models uh, Joseph brought up um, and talk about the role in the educational process. Uh, using models in education isn't a new idea. It builds largely off the ideas of J.W. Forrester at MIT, uh, who pioneered the area of systems dynamics and towards the later parts of his career spoke heavily on the use of computer simulations in, lear in the learning process. Uh, we all develop internal models, whether we do it consciously or subconsciously. When you wake up in the morning, you see the sun. If one day you were to wake up and see the moon, you'd know that something were very, very wrong. Uh, similarly, you all develop certain intuitions about your respective fields of study. Um, sorry, let me... You all develop intuitions about your respective fields of study, and uh, that's the foundation of your internal model that's been validated over years and years of, of experience in the field. Uh, so when we're confronted with something that violates our internal model, we have two choices. We can either reject the outside source of data, say it's bad data, uh, or we can change our internal model. And it's this changing to our internal model that is fundamentally what learning is. Uh, when we learn, we're really modifying our internal interpretation of things uh, and adapting it to a wider set of variables. Um, and so that's where this idea of non-intuitive concepts comes from. When we have something where we can't fit it into our model or we're struggling to change our model in a way that fits previous experience and current experience, uh, it's so-called non-intuitive. So the best way to edit a model is to externalize it, to turn it into something tangible, something that we can read line by line and scrutinize. And that's where Mathematica comes in. 
We can use Mathematica to externalize our internal models, make edits to them, simulate these edits, uh, see what effect they have in real time in front of our eyes, and then internalize them. And by the end of the development of a model, we're in a much better position to modify our internal understanding of a subject. So I want to turn your attention to this demo. Uh, it poses a question about the position of a ro rocket with respect to time and gives you some input about the mass of the rocket, et cetera. Uh, so you can see on the right, or sorry, on the left, there's a student with a rather naive understanding of physics who would be able to tell you, yeah, they can solve this problem using Newton's second law. Uh, force equals mass times acceleration, drive, uh, get the acceleration, then integrate twice to get the position with respect to time. Um, but we know that's not correct because rockets don't have a constant mass as they you know, burn their fuel. Uh, so when we expose a student to this idea that ma the mass of a rocket is not constant, they're able to take it and interpret it into a new model, one that takes this function m of t and interprets it into Newton's second law, and they come up with Newton's second law for variable mass, which as you can see has a totally different result. Uh, and it's this movement from initial model that shows a naive understanding to a further model that shows a less naive understanding that is fundamentally what learning is. They would then be able to take, perhaps after they learn differential equations and conservation of momentum, they'd be able to actually derive the real rocket equation, which we use to predict the path of rockets. Um, I want to leave you with one idea to think about, and that is that we can now use Mathematica to simulate pretty much every high school class and most of the classes taught at the undergraduate level, uh, and yet we don't use Mathematica even at the elementary and middle school levels, even though that's where the fundamental understanding of these physical systems has to come into place. If you can get a young student to understand how should a physical system behave before they ever have to prove it with equations or derivations, then they'd be in a much better position to learn high-level physics and math concepts in high school. Um, and so to discuss more about how these models can be used in the real world for business applications, I'd like to introduce Kevin Lin. Hello, I'm Kevin. All right, so this is, this is one of the models Shashira and I worked on at the time of augment. All right, let's make it a bit bigger. Okay, so what's your name? Nick. Nick, all right, so what occupation? I'm a data scientist. All right, so you're a data scientist. Well, now you have the honor of being a CEO, so now you are a CEO. So Nick, if we hand this, you this model, the first thing you will look at is this chart right here. And so what this chart says is it tells you the top five factors that will influence employees' decision to leave or stay, and it actually color codes them. So green means that the employee will stay, and red means the employee will leave. And so this is really useful as CEO because then you can just see like what factors will actually like directly impact them. Uh, something that is also really unique about this model is it also takes occupation and position into account. So you have your research scientists, you have your developers. And so if you go here and you go to your 2D plot, it will actually take into account your job role. Because as you know, different job roles have different amounts of money and people stay for the money most of the time. And so now you can see, for example, if you had an employee named Sophie and she was a data scientist, she was a research uh, scientist, uh, you would be able to see how employee attrition occurs. And so if you want to go more into depth, you go to our bubble chart. And so something that seems really intuitive is the years you stay at a company. So when you just get to a company, you might be wishy-washy if you, like, should you stay, should you leave? And so our model reflects this because at the three, after the three-year mark, it will, the amount of attrition rates actually drops significantly. As you can see, there's a nice big dip. And so after that three-year mark, you can actually optimize your work environment for your employees after that and take into consideration, oh, they're going to stay longer, so therefore I should put more consideration onto them. And so this is really intuitive, but something that might not seem intuitive at first is the distance from home. So if you look here, you might think that the distance from home is a standard one-to-one -one linear relationship. The further you are, the more likely you're going to leave. But this, the model actually doesn't really show that. It, the variance increases, which is like the distribution of points, but there's actually no linear relationship that can be found, which also, after some thinking, it also makes sense because you have the loyal employees who will go to your company no, no matter how much, how far 
they are they are away from the company. And so this will also take into consideration some of the employee mentality. And so now Shishira will discuss the more technical aspect of this model. All right, thank you, Kevin. So as you can see, we use predictive modeling to extend math into business and help businesses better understand their employees. But how does it actually work? So we took a sample data set from IBM Analytics containing different employee profiles. And these profiles contain different factors, such as the distance an employee lives from home, whether or not they worked overtime, and so forth. And essentially, we use logistic regression to find correlations between these factors and employee attrition, or whether or not the employee stays or leaves the company. So Mathematica handled the calculation aspect for us with a handy function called logic model fit, which returns a useful equation containing all the correlations that we need. And essentially, we simply use this logic model fit function to also give us statistical information that Kevin then displayed us reformatting it into the most important fact, most impactful factors table, as you can see here. So Mathematica handled the calculations aspect, and we focused on the data manipulation, fitting our data set into the logic model fit function, the visualization aspects, UI, and documentation. And as for how we did it as high schoolers, we received training from Ms. Brown, who introduced us to Mathematica and is still training us today. And we also learned from Eric at Augment, who will now explain the mentality behind Augment's training process and Augment itself. Thanks, Shashir. Um, I'm Eric Nelson, founder of Augment. Uh, really proud to say that I've had a hand in uh, training these four young gentlemen um, and, and many of their compatriots in uh, Torrey Pines High School and uh, other schools in Minnesota and other colleges as well as we expand here. And I'm honored to share the stage with Abby Brown, who has uh, dedicated a significant portion of her, of her career to uh, using Mathematica to teach math in the high school. Augment's vision, if I can pull this up here, is scalable programmer training to expertise. And we are building a nationally distributed network of programmers at all developmental stages, novice to expert. Two reasons we're doing this. Reason number one is we need greater programmer expertise to meet the software demand of today and the growing software demand of tomorrow. And as David Parnas has said, it's not a quantity problem, it's a quality problem. One bad programmer can easily create two new jobs every year. Second, we need to cultivate engineering capability in young people. And we need to help them to adopt the superior problem-solving technologies, which will dramatically expand their horizons well into the future, versus other technologies that are a bit more limiting. <coughs> so naturally, we chose Wolfram Mathematica as our training language. And there are many reasons for doing that. It's a high-level language. Uh, it's, uh, it transfers many concepts from math. And so you reduce the cognitive load, because they are already familiar with these ideas. There are a lot of reasons. I would like to illustrate it with an analogy. So for us to learn programming using a 3GL, uh, for example, like C++, we spend a lot of time at the lower level algorithm development. And we spend a lot of time, like this guy on the left, uh, working at the code level. We don't want to do that, especially not at the beginning. We want to spend as much time as we can at the design level, like these guys on the right. This changes the level of problem that we can address relatively early in a learner's training path. So we're not just cobbling roads together. We're building a system. We're building upon the, uh, the best ideas of software engineering and pedagogy that we can find. Uh, and a lot of good work has been done Mary Shaw, David Parnas, particularly in software engineering. And then uh, there are other domains here. Engineering principles and practices form the baseline skill set of new trainees at Augment. Here's just one quick example. And uh, Joseph talked about this in his section. Our trainees very quickly form the habit of properly documenting their code. And that means communicating their designer's intention, which is where they externalize their mental models, as Alex was talking about, of the problem domain and the solution domain and the components that make those up and how those components relate to one another. And this externalization makes it easier than for someone else to come along and pick up where they left off 
and it of course also shows them what they don't understand. And as Alex was informing us, when we are, able, when we are presented with an error or just a hole in our mental model, then we can respond. And so this is what we would call an internal assessment of our understanding. This is actually uh, uh, studied by Breiter and Scardamalia in Surpassing Ourselves. This is how experts learn, their, uh, n learn to address new problems in their domain. They assess the new problem based on their understanding of that domain. <coughs> and when they find holes or errors, then they address them and they correct their model versus fitting the problem to the model that they already have. Through a continuous examination of their mental models, they are continuously and subconsciously assessing their own understanding. Now, the real power of our training, however, is in the team. And so the question is, how do you externalize those mental models? How do you, as one team member, uh, understand the capabilities of another team member such that you're able to pass a task that matches their competencies. And so we've spent a lot of time also working on assessment, specifically what is called behaviorally anchored self-assessment. And the idea here is that there are certain inferential indicators that you can identify within your own uh, behavior set. When you approach a problem a certain way or when you uh, uh, code a certain way, you are able to identify signature patterns which are able to place you at a certain level or developmental stage in, uh, in your programming capability, novice to expert. This continuous merging of trainees into a production system is how we intend to economically scale programmer training such that the more advanced programmers are able to confidently hand off lower skill tasks because they have insight into the, the, the new people entering into the production system. And they do not lose robustness in their production. Okay, now these students showed you one way we might quickly scale up in high school and college. The idea is that we need to get this into the schools. We need to get this technology set and these capabilities into students' hands. And the way we do it is by developing models and simulations to support courses. As Alex mentioned, Jay Forrester spent a very long time working on this, and he's still working on it, actually, in his uh, 90s, I believe. And uh, we believe that we can, uh, through this network of well-trained programmers, we can develop a wide variety of high school and college uh, uh, course-supporting simulations. Bird Brain Game, for example, might support a study on human cognition. Uh, in comparison to, say, animal cognition. And we might be able to, as uh, Joseph was saying, test our hypotheses and acquire a narrow and deep insightful understanding of the, the nature of human and animal cognition. The simulations ultimately are designed to hook the curiosity and gradually cultivate deep insightful understanding of the domain. Now, if you extend this over time and you have a jigsaw production team of qualified trainees turned apprentices working then alongside professional programmers and mentors, then you're able to provide economical services to local businesses. And you can, ex you can imagine, it's not hard to imagine actually, serving local small business with big data analytics, what if simulations, other math-based uh, software services, and something I'm particularly interested in is servicing manufacturers and uh, give, giving rise to what is uh, being called the industrial internet of things. In other words, developing flexible manufacturing processes which can adapt to varying conditions without human intervention. In any case, I'm not concerned that we'll run out of ideas for how to apply our software engineering capability. Uh, we do appreciate your attention. We're glad to follow up by email afterwards. Thank you very much. And the emails, there they are.